Tyler was talking about the thriller astronomy. And I know, yes, those big events, the solar eclipses and the comets, they're pretty thrilling. But also, the things that don't technically move so much through the sky are pretty thrilling too. All the galaxies and all the nebula, they can be just as amazing. And one of the most famous nebulas up in our sky is the Great Orion Nebula. And that's what I, it's on our screen right now. This is up every winter and it's up in the Orion constellation. And it's very famous because it's one of the brightest ones you can look at. It's, there's young hot stars inside this hydrogen or yeah, hydrogen gas and it's causing it to glow and, and illuminate because of the, uh, the energized stars that are inside. And it's great to look at with your telescopes, even a bright area like in Chicago. This particular picture was taken by John Griffiths, one of our members. And again, using techniques that you do to get the better pictures without the long guide times, he took 51 photos between two to five minutes in length, then stacked all those photos, made a whole 165 minutes of data to get this one image. So pretty amazing what you can do if you have the patience to stack all those images and collect all that information. But So this is a famous nebula that's up in the wintertime. But our next speaker, John Schwartz, is going to show you some of the really, really amazing and really the second best stuff to look at is in the summer in the constellation Sagittarius. And John Schwartz is going to tell you about that. If you have questions for John, go down in the chat room. There's a little drop down arrow. Click on John Schwartz's name and you can key your questions in there to talk directly to John. So, John, I'll pass the floor to you. OK. OK, everybody, I just wanted to talk to you tonight about finding deep sky objects, in particular in the constellation Sagittarius. This, these are, um, this is actually the center of the Milky Way. This is where the great black hole exists that around which everything is, is turning. So um, and it happens to have lots of very uh, interesting objects that we'll be able to see with a small telescope. What do I want you to take away from this short presentation? Well, it's one of my favorite thoughts is that when I'm looking at these objects, you think that you're looking at, be it a star, any one star, or a star cluster or a nebula, even a galaxy, and you realize how incredibly far away these objects are. They may be, uh, they, they are up to millions of light years away, and we can see them quite easily with our telescopes. And you think that there are physical processes going on in those stars that are creating uh, photons, and those photons are being sent out into the universe. And ultimately, when you look at them, and it's, you're looking at something only a, maybe a few thousand people have ever seen, but you are making, in a certain sense, contact with that object. So just think about that. It's, it's one of the things that I love about this hobby. And uh, what I want to get down to specifically tonight is that by choosing one particular star in Sagittarius, a very easy one to find, it's called Lambda Sagittarii, or in, in uh, Arabic, Caus Borealis, you can use that to find several other really interesting objects. And, uh, and so we're going to look at those objects tonight. Uh, what do you need? Well, to see these things, you need a telescope. You can get by on even the small uh, 60 millimeter refractors that some people might have uh, as a start. Uh, we would probably recommend as a starter telescope, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but something just a little bit bigger. Uh, when it comes to telescope size matters, um, you get more light, you see more stuff, okay? You need a telescope that has a finder scope, okay? And the finder is attached to it. it. It has a much wider field than your telescope and it allows you to see greater part of the sky so you can actually uh, find your way to the objects you're looking for, okay? You need to know how big your finder field is, and that's pretty easy to do. Look at the full moon. Count how many full moons you have. Divide by two, and then you know how many degrees, because a full moon is half, the, is half a degree in the sky. You want to make sure your finder is well aligned with your telescope, because uh, if it's not aligned, you won't you won't actually be, um, you know, able to, it won't be as easy to find the objects. If it's well aligned, you'll have no trouble 
if you're pointing at something, you know you're pointing at that and you're moving along. So let's talk about the telescopes you're using to uh, look at these objects. Very quickly, refractors are your classic telescope. These are the kinds of uh, telescopes that I guess most people think of when they think of a telescope. It's got a, uh, a lens at the, at the end. Uh, let's say these days, from 60 millimeters to four, um, to four inches to 100 millimeters are common, okay? These, these deliver excellent, uh, virtually perfect images, uh, all things being equal. However, um, there's a price to pay for those perfect images and uh, it's dollars. <laughs> they, they tend to be the more expensive. So um, uh, say you can really work with a three to four inch refractor but you're already talking several hundred dollars and you could spend over a thousand on a, on a four inch refractor. Hey John, Anything? I hate to interrupt, but we lost your, your, your PowerPoint deck. How? You don't, you don't see it? Do you see that? Not yet, no. You don't see anything? We see, we see you, but not- uh, the, That's like, not what we want. How about, how is this? There we go. Just make it full screen. That's better. Okay. Can't get down. Okay. There so here's, here's what I would consider. I think a lot of us in the club would like to uh, push this as, as our recommended first scope. Uh, that would be a reflecting telescope. Uh, not a lot of high tech. Uh, it's on what we call a Dobsonian mount. Uh, you don't need to set things up ahead of time. You don't have to figure out anything about uh, pointing it at, at the North Star or anything. But of course, it has no mortar drive. However, this is very easy to use. And right at the beginning of the hobby, if that's where you are, um, you know, if you want to learn stars, this is the scope to have plus. This, is, this looks like an eight inch scope. This is something that you can have for five to $700 max. And that will show you enough from our dark sites that the club has, there's, there's no limit what you can see with one of these. And it's quite affordable. And uh, you know, I really like one of these. Now, what a lot of people, unfortunately this picture sometimes doesn't come out. Uh, what a lot of people have are the catadioptric telescopes. These are also excellent. They're a bit more expensive than the reflectors, which I should have said are the cheapest way to go. Uh, these also are usually the catadioptric telescopes. They're a combination of lenses and mirrors, and they give perfectly good images. Uh, they usually have, well, they always have a drive. Sometimes they have, very often nowadays, they're sold with go-to uh, functions. However, you do have to read the instructions and sometimes they don't work. I mean, generally they do. And you'll, you'll see all about using these shortly with Edith. Uh, as I mentioned before, telescope finders are very important. You really want to get, I think the biggest you can have. Uh, the finder you see on the right is probably a like 10 by 80. That means, or 10 by 50. Uh, 50 millimeter main lens. Hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, and a smaller, like regular size eyepiece. Okay. This will help you find your way through the stars from say an orientation star where you start looking for an object. Okay. To the actual thing that you're targeting. Then eyepieces. Your telescope, very often the telescopes come with eyepieces and they're probably quite adequate um, for looking at objects like we're gonna talk about uh, star clusters and nebulae. You would want something like the, tele the eyepiece that you see on the far left, the 32 millimeter Erfel, which gives you a wide field. That helps you find these things in the first place. The, the, uh, the 32 millimeters means it's lower power, okay? And generally a wider field. So 
you know, you've got more area of the sky to work with and easier to find the object you're, you're after. Then the other ones just go down and you notice in millimeters, so you go from 32 to 17.3. This is an extremely popular eyepiece. Um, it's got enough power, but not too much. Uh, it, it's a very high quality eyepiece and we'll show you a very good image of, of not very small part of the sky. Uh, for other things, star clusters, we like this one. One of our members calls this the hand grenade because it weighs about two pounds, but it's got fabulous views of star clusters. You can, uh, as I say, when you, your first telescope is likely to come with eyepieces more like this one on the far right, the Plissel 25 millimeter. That's really fine way to start. But you will want, you'll probably want to have eyepieces of different sizes, uh, different powers. So one that's say like 32 millimeter, one that's maybe 25 and one like this one uh, in front, the 14. For really high power stuff, six millimeter. That's what we call, that's the focal length of the eyepiece. Uh, for also for looking at objects in the sky, one of the objects tonight in particular, filters can help. These are little filters that screw into your eyepiece. You see the Lumicon UHC, that one works very well on the Lagoon Nebula. It really brings it out. Uh, the Lumicon over here, the what looks like 0, 3, O3, Oxygen 3 uh, filter really brings out planetary nebulae, which are another, uh, another kind of nebula that you can see in the sky. Okay, as again, again, as a rule of thumb, I use 17 to 40, 40 millimeter focal length eyepieces. But once you find a thing like what we're going to see in a minute, a globular cluster, you can use all the power you want to, to blow it up and resolve it. Okay, let's say we're going out, uh, we're going out to observe. So we go out on a clear, we try to go out on a moonless night. We, wa we want to go to a location with minimal light pollution. For us, we have sites in DeKalb and McHenry counties. Also, of course, at uh, Wildcat in uh, Wisconsin and at the Green River Conservation Area near Dixon. Okay, you can check certain apps. There's an app, Astrospheric which gives you weather conditions, it's pretty accurate, okay? Um, you're going to want to plan what you observe. Uh, you can't see everything in every season. Uh, certain seasons are better for certain things. So right now in the spring, we have the Virgo cluster of galaxies coming up. It's rising right now to the Southeast. Uh, we have globular clusters. We're going to see those because we're going to see summer objects, okay? In the fall, we have open clusters also. So, and how do we find our way? Well, what is one of the simplest ways uh, in the, in the um, you can find these in any uh, place that has magazines. Uh, the astronomy or sky and telescope magazines give, have charts in the center of the magazine that shows, gives you a, rough, a good star chart uh, for the month. Um, you definitely don't want to neglect binoculars. If you have any, bring them. Doesn't matter how big, they're all help. Um, when we go out, okay, our club members like to bring creature com comforts. We often roll like a blanket down underneath our telescopes so that our eyepieces don't break when we drop them, which happens, okay? You remember, you're going to have to wait until it's dark, okay? And, um, then you're going to need to uh, orient yourself in the sky. So for sky atlases, here's one that we really like. Um, it was sharper earlier, but um, it's sky and telescopes. They call it the pocket sky atlas. What you want is this one, the jumbo edition, which is a normal size book. It's excellent star charts on a, for, uh, on a working basis. This, this is like the best and it's also, it's built, the book is itself, you know, physically built to last. Now, Tim talked about Stellarium, that's excellent as well. Uh, any of the sky of the uh, apps that show the sky, uh, there's plenty of those and I'll mention them later. 
also like, in other words, here. There are other apps called Star Tracker, Star Safari, Star Map. Stellarium's still the best, I think, and the favorite one in the club. Okay. If it's a summer evening in, in Sagittarius and we're looking down to the south, you're, look, you're hoping that you're in a spot where there aren't too many trees on your southern horizon. And so you're going to be preparing your scope for this. Um, you're, you know that you're looking, when you look at, it's in between the constellation Scorpio and Sagittarius, you're looking at the center of the Milky Way. And if you use binoculars, you'll see all kinds of interesting uh, sights down there. Obvious, even in binoculars, you will see some of the nebulae we're going to look at. Okay, now when I talk about the objects we're going to look at, we're going to mention that they are, they, they're on a list called the, they're usually called M numbers. Uh, the M is Messier for Charles Messier. He was a Frenchman, lived at the time in, in well, in the 18th century, almost lost his head in the French Revolution. Uh, he was actually a comet hunter. Okay, he was a comet hunter who, um, I'm sorry. Uh, while looking for comets, he kept running into uh, non-comets. These were objects that were permanently in the sky. So he um, made a list as kind of working aid for these comets. And, you know, what is he remembered for? The working aid, not the comets. Well, I don't even know what comets he would have found. But his list is known by every amateur astronomer. And we refer to these things as M with the number, okay? What we're going to look at tonight are uh, M22, M28, M20, uh, let's see, M55, okay? And uh, let's see, I said, I think M8, yes, and M20. Okay, so now we're looking, what you see now is the constellation Sagittarius with the Messier objects. Hopefully you all see these with the M's, okay? You see there's quite a few of them. That's not accidental. That's because they're at the galactic center. You see on the, on the chart um, that there is, it is actually noted galactic center, okay? The, uh, there's another view of it. Okay, this is what it looks like in a nice dark sky, such as we virtually never get around here, but which we can kind of get at Wildcat and as in at Green River. And uh, it's, it's, I'm sure it's what the octors see out west. So the center of the Milky Way, you can actually see it. You see, uh, it, uh, they identify the uh, Lagoon Nebula and the Trithid Nebula. Now, Notice the shape of Sagittarius. It's a perfect, we call it the teapot. It actually looks like that. It doesn't look like much like somebody shooting an arrow, but it does look like a teapot. And the key star is this one. This is Lambda Sagittarii. Okay, the first thing we're going to look at actually um, is right near Lambda Sagittarii. This is a globular cluster M22. It's arguably it's one of the five best certainly that we can see and it's very easy to find if you look at that star lambda sagittarii it's just to the left and above what you do is if assuming you've got a, a telescope at low power and your finder is aligned you center it on lambda and then you start going a little bit left and a little bit up and you will see two stars that are a couple of maybe a degree or two apart. And right between them, you'll see a little cloud. That is M22. And now you're not going to see it exactly like this, but depending on the telescope, with six to eight inch telescope and above, you will see this object uh, broken into stars. It will be an awesome sight. And when you see these stars, it almost looks like they're in strings coming out. It's, I'm sure it's just a, uh, it's a, it's an optical illusion, but you'll get that feeling. They look like legs or strings coming out, okay? Uh, by the way, M22 is, I mean, M22 and all of the globular clusters basically 
circle the center of our galaxy, circle the center of the Milky Way. We, a lot of them, we believe, are the cores of galaxies that our Milky Way captured. And this is all that's left. So uh, yeah, M M22 is, uh, by the way, it's 10,000 light years from Earth. That's, that's really not very far as these things go. Right near M22, now again, working off Lambda Sagittarius, just to the right and a little bit above is M28. Now this is not as glorious as M22, but it's still an exciting thing to see. And uh, it's another globular cluster, as you can see. Uh, and it has, um, it is, it is about 18,000 light years from Earth. The globular clusters are almost all made up of old stars. I mean, stars like eight to 10 billion years old or older, okay? Now we're gonna have switch to something else more, a uh, little more uh, mysterious looking, the Lagoon Nebula. This is just off to the right of those stars. It's, it will be visible in the finder of your telescope. It will be visible in uh, binoculars. And it's a, it's a hauntingly beautiful object uh, that's there uh, about 4,000 light years from Earth. It is, um, it, it is an area where uh, star, stars are being born in it even as we speak. It's one of our favorites, and it responds very well to an ultra high contrast uh, filter. Just above it is the Triffid Nebula. So um, the Triffid is uh, really requires dark skies, but you actually can, with an eight inch scope, you can actually make out those divisions in it. Okay, it's it's another uh, what we call an emission nebula. Uh, and it's also about 4,000 light years from Earth. There's, if you look, if you can see my pointer right down here, there is actually another star cluster, uh, an M cluster, M21, right near it. Hey, John, can we show everybody where they can find more information on this? And I am almost done. Forward there? Okay, thank yeah. you. And then uh, the final one is absolutely spectacular, but you need a really dark sky for it. This is M55 globular cluster. It's large and it's, when I first saw it, I was shocked because it was actually bigger than I was expecting. And uh, I didn't even know it was a cluster. Uh, to it has to be found. This is one of the ways, well, I thought I, <laughs> God. let's see if we can bring it back. Okay, if you look at the teapot, but this is one of the ways we work is you see these two bright stars, they'll be very easy to see. If you can see it at all, you'll see these stars in the teapot. Then what, what I typically do, I use my finder to start moving over here to the left of this word. This one is uh, Zeta Sagittarius. I will find this triangle, which should be visible in my finder scope. Then I'm gonna move over to the left. I'll see the two little stars. If they're on this chart, I'll see them in a finder. Then you'll see these three. Then you move down and you see these three. And then you, you might even see the, the cluster right there. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, we have several, several books that we recommend. Uh, I really do like the Burnham Celestial Guide. It's, it's beautifully written. It dragged me into many things besides astronomy, in fact. And although it came out in the 70s, it's actually not that far out of date, if at all. He made a lot of good guesses, okay? There's another fine book called Annals of the Deep Sky, which might be hard to get because the publisher has gone under uh, just recently, but it is basically a, a quantum improvement, a vast improvement actually on the Burnham's guide, but not in its writing, but in its facts, okay? Other books, uh, by, which is Messier's Nebula and Star Clusters by Kenneth Glenn Jones, gives a lot of uh, both maps and descriptions, and the Messier Objects by 
Stephen James O'Mara. He's an excellent observer. He's got incredibly sharp eyes and um, he observes from Hawaii. So of course for him, he sees everything in small binoculars. Uh, it's not like what we experience, but it's still a beautifully written book. So with that, uh, I hope I can get you into realizing that in a few minutes, you can see millions of stars. When you look at these globular clusters, there are hundreds of thousands of stars in each one. And just imagine that, imagine what you're seeing and enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think the neat thing about Sagittarius is whenever our club goes camping and you look out in the, uh, in the field of the 20, 30 telescopes that are set up, half of them are point at, pointed at Sagittarius because it's all the cool things that John talks about. So yeah, yeah. yeah Orion Nebula is great in the wintertime, but Sagittarius is one of the focal points in the summer. So thank you very much, John. And with that, Mike, I'll pass it on to you for our next speaker.